Welcome to everybody watching out there. I'm PhotoFest Executive Director Stephen Evans, and I want to thank you for joining us for the first of what we hope will be many editions of PhotoFest Creative Conversations Digital Series. I'd like to thank PhotoFest Communications Director Vinod Hobson and PhotoFest Associate Curator Max Fields for spearheading this program. And our thanks also must go to PhotoFest major biennial sponsors. And they include the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, David and Martha Moore, the WWW Foundation, and the PhotoFest Board of Directors. And there were many other funders as well, and they will all be acknowledged at the end of the program. So I, I hope you'll take a look at that. We, we really appreciate their support. As we begin, um, I'd just like to say that despite the challenges of the current global pandemic, the PhotoFest team is working very diligently and with great persistence to fulfill our mission to be a platform for art and ideas addressing important issues within society. We support the field of photography and the many practices that intersect with photography. And that can be seen in our 2020 biennial central exhibition and book, African Cosmologies, Photography Time and the Other, which was curated by Mark Seeley. I think many of us have recently seen the news that the coronavirus is disproportionately infecting and killing African Americans across much of the United States, especially in the South, a region where Black Americans are more likely to live in poverty and suffer from chronic disease. African Americans make up 70% of the coronavirus deaths in Louisiana, for example. And given our current crisis, I cannot think of a better time to engage with art and artists that take an unflinching look at institutional racism, bias, and inequality. Tonight, PhotoFest Associate Curator and Director of Publishing Max Fields will moderate a conversation with biennial artists Leo and Shobun Bailey. Please enjoy. Don't be afraid to pose questions to the speakers. Take extra care of yourselves in these days because you're really important to us and to many others. And I thank you again for joining us this evening. Max? Thank you so much, Stephen. And um, thank you everyone who is joining us from home. Um, we're really thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to offer what is the first in a series of online programs that are um, in line directly with the um, African Cosmologies uh, Biennial Exhibition that was curated and on view earlier this spring and currently um, on hold. Um, today, I'll be speaking with two incredible artists who I had the incredible opportunity to meet um, through the uh, core residency program of which they were um, uh, current residents. Um, uh, the two artists, as uh, Stephen mentioned, are Leo and Chobin Bailey. Um, both of them um, are individual artists who have uh, individual practices, but for the um, 2020 Biennial collaborated to create um, a sound installation and a graphic installation in the East Gallery of the Silver Street Studios exhibition space. Um, and we're really thrilled to be able to talk more about that, um, that work. Um, since it's now behind closed doors. Um, I'll do a brief introduction of the artists and then we'll start with the questions um, with the, uh, to, the, uh, to the artists. Um, Shobin Bailey received a dual uh, bachelor's in Russian language and literature and molecular biology from the University of Michigan and an MFA from Carnegie Mellon U University School of Art. He's participated in exhibitions and screenings at institutions including the Museum of Fine Arts Houston Kilroy Metal Ceiling in Brooklyn, La Mama Galleria in New York, the Miller Institute for Contemporary Art in Pittsburgh, and the Brecht Forum in New York City. 
He's participated in residencies at SOMA in Mexico City, the School for Poetic Computation in New York, and Sean Dakin, Storm King in the Hudson Valley. He is currently a fellow at the CORE program at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And uh, for the biennial 2020, Bali um, worked with artist and fellow CORE resident, Leo, to produce a site-specific commissioned artwork that we'll talk about today. Leo uh, studied business management at, um, and arts and design at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, Brazil, attended the School of Visual Arts, uh, Paqui Lagi, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, and graduated in 2018 with the title um, Meister Schuler uh, in, uh, from the University of Arts in Berlin. Leo's performative practice and artistic works were presented in the core exhibition at the Glasshouse School of Arts Museum of Fine Arts in Houston in 2019. Um, at the Mutterzunge at uh, Babylon, Berlin, and Superlife at Frederick at Fre Frankfurt and Maine. In 2018, Leo was awarded a fellowship in the core program at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where he is currently based. Uh, please join me in welcoming these two um, incredible artists. Okay. Hello, Chauvin. Now I'm just waiting on Leo. I am here. You need to. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, well, thank you both again um, for joining us today. Um, let's see. I'd like to begin uh, by asking if each of you could introduce yourself and give us a little background on your practice up, into this, up to this point. Essentially, if you could introduce yourself to an audience who may or may not be familiar uh, with your individual practices, how would you describe your practice? And could you talk about your central area of research as it stands right now? You wanna go first, Shopin? Yeah, sure. Um, you can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, so I work primarily with video, sound, some sculpture, um, and installation. And a lot of my work right now is dealing with what I refer to as spatial technologies and sort of various spatial systems of control um, with a particular interest in like design practices that relate to that or sort of the history of design in relation to sort of spatial control. It's kind of a broad overview. Um, I, I think we had this conversation before. I don't call myself an artist, I'm more a performer slash writer or whatever. Um, I am heavily invested in performative practices and their relationship with forms of writing in general. Um, I think the main, the funny thing is kind of like the main core of my research takes a little bit of what showed me an idea, but I'm concerned with the sort of abstraction uh, or the possibility of abstraction um, and its relationship with ideas such as representation and so forth. Um, and I, I think I'm working for the past two years in a project that is quite long. It's called Just Another Shady Bridge, dealing with multiple performative practices from burlesque gallery um, to theater and I'm trying to figure out what all of those things mean together um, everything in relationship to opera and the history of Western performance so to say yeah. um, so I thought today we could take this opportunity to really get invested in talking and speaking about your work um, that was commissioned for the African Cosmologies exhibition, If I Don't Look You in the Eye. And before we do that, I thought it would perhaps be useful to show the audience exactly what that looked like. So we're gonna do that for a second. Um, so now we're looking at the installation as it exists in the Silver Street Gallery. Um, and maybe for a frame of reference, we can take a few minutes to listen to the sound component and then we can talk about that. Eyes that black 
you in the eye is because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness. I gather there are some people out behind that blackness, out behind that blackness, out behind that blackness out there. But if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. If I don't look you in the eye, if I don't look you in the eye behind that blackness, I gather there are some people out behind that blackness there. But if I don't look you in the eye, I gather there are some people out behind that blackness there. But if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness. I gather there are some people out behind that blackness, out behind that blackness, out behind that blackness out there. But if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. If I If I doesn't see you, I gather there are some people out behind that blackness. Out behind that blackness. But if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness if I don't look you in the eye, I don't see you. If I doesn't see you, that blackness. If I don't look you in the eye, if I doesn't look you in the eye, behind that blackness it is because all I see is blackness. All I see is blackness. All I see is blackness. That blackness out behind I gather there are some people. So one of the things I should describe um, before asking you a question is what that work is. It's, and maybe, maybe you could describe that better than I can. But for the general audience, the installation is composed of a floor graphic on the floor, this vinyl graphic, um, and then a, um, a sound installation, a surround sound installation. Could you two describe how you began uh, collaborating on the commissioned work, um, If I Don't Look You in the Eye, and tell us about how that work came together and what exactly you were interested in examining? Mm, I think, so it's important to say that If I Don't Look You in the Eye, the title um, is also the sentence, what is being said. It is a quote that's coming from Noam Chomsky inside of Manufacturing Constant. This documentary, I think it's forgot already, I think it's 92. Um, but in that specific moment, like Chomsky is addressing an invisible audience and talking with like this invisible audience that he cannot see, and then he says um, what inspired the work. Um, and so sort of the making of it was. Um, I think Chauvin can come here a little bit stronger because we did a, a composite of a few recording, um, which is exhibition space of the photo fest. And together with uh, the text that we've been writing uh, around what Chomsky was saying um, in relationship to his discussion of ideology and also like forms of being present inside of the room. Yeah, and to clarify this, if you couldn't hear it in the audio, the statement that um, Leo and Chauvin were taking from by Chomsky is, there are some people out behind that blackness there, but if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness. And, um, and in this line, um, it's Chomsky is standing in front of an audience that he can't see. And he, he utters this in kind of complete innocence to say, uh, don't take this as being rude, but you've, you've taken those, those words and, um, and taken them out of context to kind of show the violence of language, or, or at least that's kind of one of the things that, that ends up happening in this. Um, it's, 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 
And it's also funny to think about um, how we're addressing an audience who also cannot see us right now. Um, <laughs> it's something that I was thinking um, about. But, but one of the questions I also I wanted to ask is, is, is really about the way in which your work is a standout in the biennial exhibition, as it's the only work in the exhibition that doesn't utilize photographic um, methods in process or presentation. Um, and before the exhibition, we talked a lot about um, what this could add to the curatorial thematic of African cosmologies. Um, we spoke about visibility, and I'm curious to hear what you both think about the relationship between visibility and synesthetic experiences. Okay, I'll take this one. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I think like in that quote, that definitely like already begins to address that question of what is necessary within the visual in order to sort of address or sort of like make communication or whatever sort of inter interbeing possibility possible, I guess. Um, and and so I think that work like this question of like what it does. Um, Like, I, I mean, I, I guess the synesthetic question, I don't know exactly, but the invocation of scene is kind of like fully a part of that work. Like the samples of the, I mean, you can kind of hear it in that clip, but samples from the actual site where the installation is or used in the work. So this like way in which it kind of has a time-based relationship to kind of entering into the space and then hearing those same sounds that you hear within the work within the actual rest of the exhibition. And then you come back to that site and there is again, like a, there's like a memory of that site that's kind of constantly interplayed with the work, I would say. Do, I think, Shobin, do you remember that we had this talk about like architectural sounds and what could happen with it? Um, there is this thing because when I think of like, uh, a composite of experiences they are like playing in different senses. Uh, I think so much about that, you know, like the construction of a space and how architecture that inherently is at any level. Um, and the field recordings that we did is literally like the architectural sound, you know, like it's, I don't know, the building and how it behaves and like the AC. I think there is one specific sound that we could hear right now that was almost like bouncing back and forth, which was electricity running through one of the cables that we're listening to. And you're just like, oh, what, what is happening inside of this space and constituting also this space. Um, so I think like adding to that, there's also this question, there is a sense of repetition that is part of the making of the space that we some, at some level use it or not. And I mean, yeah, we did use it in terms of making uh, making the text uh, and I think yeah maybe is this what like constructs the the synesthetic experience I mean because I'm thinking of bodies in general and how they like walk around they, it's always like there's no way of avoiding this you know um, even the experience of one thing is not necessarily an isolated experience of that thing but the relationship of one to the rest to the environment and I feel like if I don't look you in the eye, there is, um, uh, in the text, when like he, it is complete, we talk, we discuss this a little bit, you know, like what is I think, the question of the eye there, which is both the eye, who is the spoken eye, who is the subject in like some parts of the sentences and the eye, which is the ocular, you know, like the visual <laughs> organ the possibility of seeing it uh, at all, like having the organ that sees something. I think we're sort of, we kind of like went there even a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, this, the, the subject of the, like the literal, like um, physical subject of the, uh, essentially of like the performative installation for you, is that subject the viewer? Is that what activates this this work? Um, essentially, because does that become uh, does that 
how does that how does the view the the viewer sort of add to the sort of like performative elements of this or uh, because i'm i'm thinking that when you're stepping into the spotlight and i'll share the i'll share the the image again if you're when you're stepping into the spotlight of the space um you're you're literally um made a, into a focus point in the work I mean, and this 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 makes me think a lot about like spectacle, which I know that you've um, you've sort of you've addressed Leo in your work specifically. Um, I'm I'm just curious to think about like what is the or to ask your opinion about this sort of performative aspect um, upon the viewer, how that activates and affects the work. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I feel like this exists, you know, like this is there. I think the performativity. That's the, the word that I usually use to address the, this question. It's specifically because it's connected with an idea of behavior uh, in any given space. You know, like there's always an expectation of how one is supposed to behave regardless of where one is. You know, like even, um, I mean, maybe one could like go further into this thinking of the construction of private space if they even really exist and how they do, one would deal with that. But I do think and this is part of what interests me is how um, in architecture space or in any, at any level design space uh, helps to build a relationship with things, you know. Uh, and I remember that I tease show being a lot about this, <laughs> about like the, the, the role of the viewer inside of a piece that is continuously playing, not necessarily only when people are there, um, and like to what extent one like to what extent like the piece is like activated then in that sense or the piece is part of that space or it's like the piece is simply there as things are in place usually. Um, and I have a question that kind of veers a little bit, um, but as somebody who's really dealing with lens based um, artwork primarily at PhotoFest and as PhotoFest is a, um, an organization really dedicated to examining lens-based praxis. Um, I'm curious about your response as a, to making a commissioned work that withholds a photographic rendering. It's like I said in the beginning, it's the only work in the exhibition that does not have any sort of um, lens-based or um, photographic um, methodology like at hand or, or being utilized, I should say. Um, was that a conscious decision in um, maybe that you were thinking about working against or working with um, when you were invited? Were you thinking, well, let's not curtail our practice? Um, yeah, I'm just curious to hear about your decision to sort of withhold any sort of like photographic um, process, especially since um, Shobin, you're you're uh, a filmmaker and do have that, and so your collaborative collaboration could have taken this form, um, perhaps even as like a performance for video. All right, I'll answer that just because I feel like <laughs> I have to because as the, like, the video person. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I think it's funny because I maybe we'll talk about this more, but I, I find my own practice kind of also asking this question about what what it means to kind of use this photographic reproduction as a method of producing the real or whatever that might mean. Um, and I think that was kind of a discussion. Actually, it's like kind of part of maybe why Leo and I had a lot of discussions over the last year or so about various things that kind of ended up being something that we kind of kept coming back to as a, a thing that we maybe both were thinking about in different ways. Um, and I think that kind of led us, to, I mean, this is graphic, I think is, you know, that idea of graphic in general is something that kind of has an important and complicated history in relation to what we kind of think of as photographic reproduction. Um, that oh yeah cool um that and I, I think maybe Leo 
can pick up in a second on this in terms of like the references that are kind of coming into this, but it definitely is dealing a little bit with this early 20th century kind of history of color theory very directly. And, um, and I think that our, some conversations we were having started to kind of think about actually in particular textuality and that role in kind of constructing and framing um, how blackness in particular was sort of thought of within the aesthetic realm over the course of the 20th century. Um, and that kind of led us to Kandinsky and something that I think maybe Leo could talk a little bit more about. <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I don't think, what we're thinking, Shoni and I were in conversation before, I don't think we addressed this before. Yeah, because you asked, but you didn't answer. Shoni and I were in conversation already for quite a while, not necessarily about working together, but we just talked with each other because we share a wall in our studios and we just, we just talk a and I really like <laughs> Um And there was this one moment specifically in which we're trying to understand the role of representation in general. We have different conversations which you were spanning from different films that we have watched it. And also there is one thing that I think is very uh, symbolic that we talked about um, <clears throat> Clarice Lispector and the cockroach inside of the hour of the star. Because there's a cockroach there, which is not a cockroach, and people usually think it's a cockroach. It's a physical cockroach that she's talking about. That one is placing inside of one's mouth. But she's using language. I mean, for me, Clarice does this thing with language. Clarice to the specter, I don't know how, how well people know that her. So she was naturalized Brazilian and wrote a lot, and it's amazing. Tons of books. A couple of things have been translated already. But the of the Star has this uh, sort of descriptive image of a woman putting a cockroach inside of her mouth. Um, and this cockroach appears over and over. Uh, and it's never, when, it, when one reads it, at least when I read it, and always when I return to it, although the words are there and the image is being painted, it's never about the actual uh, image in itself that is like the, the visual constitution of a person putting a cockroach inside of your mouth. It's, Sort of like this disgust, this feeling, how that could be related with some like gut reaction that one would have. Um, so Shobi and I were in this conversation about language and its relationship with representation and possibility of abstraction. And eventually I, I was looking heavily at the beginning of the 20th century forms of abstraction, like specifically in sort of Kandinsky to see what was happening and what enables um, both U.S. American history and also history in other places, um, any relationship to photography, what enabled as well the idea of um, composition, you know, like, because photography, I was, before you mentioned, uh, there is nothing really, uh, there's no process of photography inside of this work, and I was thinking about the, the graphic composition on the floor, it's like, well, I don't know about, <laughs> you know, like, there is some sort of, there is a lot of photography in set up, which is a discussion of how to deal with composition and its relationship uh, with, like, creating a frame that is definitely translated to an experience of the space. And the composition as they are made, they resemble discussions that Kandinsky were having, Kandinsky was having about, um, color theory indeed, but the relationship of color with shapes and how in his writing, there is a match, a sort of like some specific shapes, they come with the term colors for their better understanding and also um, achieving a, a certain form of potential that they have inherently. So we did, we went back to Kandinsky, so the graphic composition is literally like a riff on what Kandinsky was doing, this one that you're showing right now is the graphic composition, I think number two, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong. The, um, the one that we have on the floor is the number three, which is the overlapping, the total overlapping of the three shapes. Um, the triangle in yellow, the square in uh, magenta, and the, the circle in ciano. We change the colors to adapt to the, our context, which is kind of like the digital 
world and how things are painted. So we use primary colors. They are the, um, the primary colors of digital printing um, to think of how these things could come together and then think of this one, like this is not necessarily because there's not an image that is constituted in a photorealistic way that something is not dealing with photography. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and that question is not, it's not only not tied to photography as like, it is also tied with the philosophical background that is part of that, which was the discurs discussions that Shobi and I were having, you know, like how can we imagine things? Like what are the possibilities of imagining and rep representing it all that are not like bound to some specific rules, you know? Like when Kandinsky is talking about black, he talks, there is an extract of this in sort of the piece. He talks about of black as a pitch dark color that is basically nothing. It is, it is literally nothing uh, for him. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's fair to think, you know, like, well, what does it mean to say that black is nothing in terms of a color, especially right now, if you think that there is Kerry Jane Marshall paintings where black becomes an actual color. Uh, and if like people are more like, I don't know, old school and traditional as Pierre Solage, also with the same thing of the sickness and like the station of the reflection on black, you know, I think those things they were sort of in our head. And I also went far away from your question, questions and then I, I feel like I did, I did. I did. You know, I, I, think, I think that answers a lot. Um, because I, I do think um, it is a it is a really this work is quite complex in its um, in its sort of mechanical underpinnings <laughs> specifically um, because as as we're talking um, as we're talking we've dropped a million names that are very specific uh, with their own sort of um, art history kind of. Um, backing them, or even like theoretical histories, sort of backing them. I mean, you've you've talked a bit that this that these three colors were pulled from uh, writing by Kand Kandinsky in his book um, on the spirit spirituality of color in art. Um, is that concerning the spirit in art? There we go. Con yes, that's right. And um, I'm just mixing all of those words together. Um, and. But one of the one of the interesting gestures that you talked about with me was the idea of overlapping these image these these three colors so that each of the um, lines of text rendered in uh, cyano um, magenta and um, and uh, um, and yellow um, <laughs> where uh, they become kind of blurred um, and you can see that. Um, or at least they they kind of not blurred, but they run up against each other, and it's those instances when two or three colors uh, combine create like a, they create something different than themselves, other than themselves. Which I thought that was like a really interesting part of the work. It reminds me some of the operations in this work remind me of another work um, that we have in the exhibition by Carrie Mae Weems, Colored People, um, which exists. Um, as a, seri a group series of gridded images um, of young um, black kids with um, various hues of color overlaid over their faces. And next to these photographic renderings are um, plates of, um, of colored hues. So essentially you have this meditation on the relationship to um, is blackness a color? Is the word black, can black be represented as a color? Um, or is that something maybe too limiting? And I know a lot of the readings that you and I, um, Leo, talk about a lot, like um, Fred Moten really challenged, by Fred Moten really challenged um, that sort of idea. Um, you know, um, I don't want to go too long because we're running on internet time. So I'm going to ask, I, I wanted to ask this question that might take, take a bit of time to, to answer. Can you, can you talk about your interests? And I, I brought this up a little bit ago, but I, I'm, I'm really curious to hear. Can you talk about your interest in spectatorship and spectacle in both of your individual practices? Um, you work with media in such a way that complicates the relationship between 
the viewing audience and subjects of your work. Something is usually withheld from the viewer or it's blocked. And I'm thinking a lot about the works that you both created for your um, core exhibition. And perhaps you can talk about those works and describe the methods you employ to challenge a sort of empathetic gaze or it's like, or the implication of, or, or if you could talk about the implication of the viewer in those work and, um, and I'll actually, I'll pull up, I have examples of those works so that people could see what I'm talking about. And I'll start with Leo. Okay, okay, so my, okay, <clears throat> I'm so bad with uh, this, I'm thinking, I'm organizing my thoughts. Uh, for this piece, it is uh, the second act of my long-term project that I've been working on for two years right now. Um, uh, it is called Just Another Shady Bitch, Act Two, Let Me Entertain. Um, I mean, you can just like flip around the, the images. I think you have more than one, right? Or we have one, yes, yes. It is basically like a, a room installation in which like people come in and you have three furniture elements that you can see there, uh, like a armchair, a side table, and a piano. Um, <clears throat> there are two uh, Broadway music scores with uh, opening the page of Let Me Entertain You, which is a song in the, uh, wait, what you, which year is that? Don't remember the year. The Gypsy, oh gosh, sorry, Gypsy musical um, theater production. Um, and yeah, so this is the background of this piece. And my relationship with spectatorship inside of this all. I keep going back to this question of performativity, you know, like I think the constitution of like spectator or like or any spectatorship in general presupposes a division in the relationship of what is being shown and that which is looking. Um, I don't necessarily agree with those things. I don't necessarily think that the word is constituted in that way. And therefore I keep, <clears throat> yeah, so this long project that I'm doing right now, investigating performative practices is to imagine what would happen if those relationships would be slightly different, you know? Specifically in the space that is let me entertain, there is a constitution of a possible performance space in which no performance ever happens. However, all the elements for that performance species, they, they are there, you know? And also, I think like this one can see better, every single time that someone steps in, there are some um, sensor lights that turn on and it spotlights exactly the entrance of this space. Uh, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to not <laughs> like overread my own work because that's stupid. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so it's basically like it's straightforwardly uh, giving the possibility of like letting one to think uh, what are the other articulations of that relationship in which there is one who is necessarily or who may be performing for an audience, uh, depending on what you're saying in like the reading of the, the piece, but maybe it's like, it is a relation, it is inherently a relationship, you know? So there is no, uh, there is no performance unless someone assumes and wants to be a spectator. Uh, perhaps this is a question or a statement. So is there a performance if everybody agrees not to watch someone? and like use games as a form of engagement. Is that, does that exist? Yeah, and continuing, continuing with this, like these ideas, I think, I think it's really good to hear you talk about this work in relation to the work that's on view at PhotoFest because I think a lot of the mechanics are there and I think it'd be interesting to show Chauvin's um, work for the, for the core exhibition because I think taking a look at both of your individual practices and seeing how they came together in this final um, installation um, will start to really take shape. Chauvin, can you talk about the, the work trust study that you presented for the core exhibition this spring? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's a video that is a rare projection. That's a rare projection on like paper vellum. Um, and it's like a 15 minute video that recounts a uh, um, an interview with this uh, worker within this informal banking system that's kind of commonly used in South Asia and other parts of the world it's called Hoala. Again, often gets kind of mistranslated as trust, which is where the title is kind of referencing that. Um, but it's also kind of, I mean, just to go on the spectator idea to focus on that part. Um, so this video is a presentation of this interview, but it's done with on-screen text. Um, but it's sort of presented almost as if it's a script for a reperformance of this interview that doesn't actually happen. Um, and um, it sort of deals with this informal banking network called Hawala that is kind of very well known for avoiding record keeping and maybe part of what it has allowed it to survive for so long is its very sort of reliance on kinship networks and avoidance of keeping documents. Um, and it has to do with other things like it got implicated in Paris financing after September 11th. Um, but so through these interviews with these various people who obviously want their identities hidden, but are willing to give me very small parts of what this thing that I'm trying to inquire about is like a partial whatever documentarian artist, whatever. Um, that sort of there's like two layers of withholding in a way, like what they're withholding from me, what I'm withholding from the audience. Um, and yeah, I guess I don't know about the question, yeah, the spectator question, but I did want to like say something that I just thought about that was kind of interesting. Is this work and in a very different way in Leo's work also kind of deal with the expectation or there's like sounding objects within it um, that I don't think I'd actually put together because we we're kind of making all of these works at the same time. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. but, and then the, the Photofest piece has this sort of, you know, there's like a sort of, in, some sort of visuality that seems to be sort of implied or withheld or expectation of that being withheld. And here the sort of sounding objects are kind of left quiet in a way. Um, yeah. Now, this work also, there's some withholding at a, in this trust study too that was in the core exhibition in the form of this shape on top of the mirror um, that obscures vision which was also, which reminded me a lot of your installation. Uh, yeah, 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 totally. And this work also like references things and kind of even more directly in a way, it references things from interviews, objects that I've never seen that are related to this banking network. Um, so their reproduction is sort of something that's done through, I mean, almost like a story, like it's me making an image out of something where there is no image. And it also happens to be a technology that's about sort of producing and blocking images at the same time, I guess. Amazing. Um, okay, we're gonna take a few questions now. Um, and we already received two, so I'll reiterate them. Um, received three. Um, okay, so Slant Rhyme asks, um, visibility slash architecture, you're not present in the performance space or piece. What does it mean to be seen in your invisibility? Um, I, I feel like I want to read that question again because maybe I don't want to say anything stupid. <laughs> You're not present in the performance space or piece. What does it mean to be present in the performance space or piece? Um, being present there. You know, like, um, I'm one of the things that I'm very interested in are. Uh, <laughs> a specific part of like Western philosophy that is dealing with the question of presence and how that's supposed to be important and connected with like subject and all of these things. I don't, um, I usually don't go there very often. You know, like I think uh, the space in itself, I'm not trying to attribute to the space a sort of agency that is inherently thought of that is articulated by moving bodies, independently moving bodies, which are people. But I do think that spaces do carry, and also architecture, like they do carry sort of um, presets uh, 
but they carry it in a way which is very conventional, you know, like, so that's why when I mentioned before and I was talking about this, I was talking about performativity, um, thinking of, this is necessarily a relationship. Um, so it's just, it is just a relationship. It's all about the relationship that one establishes with the space and how they are navigating the conventions that they know, protocols of behavior, um, yeah. yeah. There's another question that I think is really interesting that goes to this. It, it, and it's by um, Stephen Evans asks, you're creating a narrative space through aural means. Are you also intending for visitors to form a visual image in their mind? It's a really provocative question. I'm curious to hear what your discussion was about that. Ooh, this is nice. Do you remember this show, man? We hey. about don't. I don't know if I do actually. <laughs> um, it was <laughs> because there's this one thing that we like sort of touched on that because we are dealing with this sort of um, with the graphic composition, we're dealing with this sort of abstraction that is, of course, like the turn of the 20th century Western uh, Western European aesthetics, but we're doing that with words. And there was this one moment in which we're sitting, and I told you, oh, we're doing this thing with like. Uh, with this specific typography and we are like rubbing on some spirituality that is not necessarily Western because of how this is really constituted, but we're not directly addressing that. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> the calligraphy question. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean like, yeah, there's like just that question of like, I mean, the calligraphic and like what, what text is used in relation to the image and like, I don't know, various other sorts of non represent cultures that sort of veer from representation that I think it kind of, yeah, like that question of like, is, fuck, I mean, I, I have a hard time speaking about this too, because I think it's something that I'm like, still sort of thinking through a little bit too, but that, yeah, that idea of like the, the mind image isn't the, I don't want to say it's not like it's not an intentional, but that's not. I mean, I have a hard time speaking about it because I think questions like that presume the sort of photographic a lot in their sort of constitution of what an image sort of is now, which I think As... from like a media theoretical point of view, it like the idea like of the mind image is informed by the photographic apparatus um, that. Like there's this great Bart text that I actually was just reading a few days ago where he's sort of talking about this idea, which relates to the Lispector thing about like, he's, he's saying something about how there's this, I think it's Flaubert, but it's like the notion that like these things being described have so little to do with the real until like no one's even talking. It Like the real is just like so unrelated to what these writers are doing that like, that idea of an image is like, it's hard to like pin down using the same language that we do after the photographic apparatus. I don't know if that, I feel like that's maybe just a way to avoid Stephen's question, but like, <laughs> that's sort of how I feel about it, that it's like, yes, that's there, but like maybe that's maybe the question we're asking in some of the work too. But you know, I, I will, I feel like there is a, a return question to that. So like what aesthetic works are not dealing with oral and spirituality in their making. Um, given that, for instance, when we're talking about Kandinsky and the spiritual in the awe, like there's so much of art history that comes, which is gonna end up touching or binding the two things, you know? Like the spirituality of Kandinsky, it's very clearly Christian, you know, like there's nothing but that. <laughs> and you know, like in the other places where uh, those things will also rise, if we're gonna think of like, or history in general. Uh, I mean, oh my God, contemporary photography and its relationship with the profane, you know, like all of those things. What, I, mean, I would ask myself then, what um, works are not creating this thing? What works, is it possible to make uh, something? Is it possible to create an aesthetic experience that is not delimited by um, a sense of spirituality, a sense of religion that's not necessarily the like 
this is terrible. The, the Western idea of religion with those specific plans, but like an idea, an idea of returning, reconnection, as some very boring people would say that it's coming from Latin, the idea of religion, <laughs> uh, and the idea of uh, reconnecting, religare, and the possibility of doing that is their aesthetic experiences that do not do that. I don't know. <laughs> Um, we have another good question. Um, why Chomsky and why manufacturing consent? It's a good question. Uh, I don't know. It's like... Well, there was something that kind of came up where we're, there was two things that kind of, I feel like in our conversations came up. That was one that was sort of, I mean, just the role of samples in general, but that there's like, a, we were talking about Steve Wright of course, when we were sort of thinking about sound and obviously that's a, and but come out in particular, this sort of like important work both in minimalist sound practices, but also it was like commissioned as a work that was literally supposed to benefit the Harlem Six that were actually, you know, where the sample comes from one of these people that had been beaten by the police during this case. Um, but that the way it like recirculated after, like this idea that it, like you can see very clearly in that sample sort of, or even that work, like Steve Reich's work was almost a site specific work. It was almost like a moment in that in its reproduction, it's sort of the criticality of like Steve Reich as this white dude talking about the Harlem Six using the sample <laughs> happened. And it wasn't that it like, I should, he's like, oh no, he's free from that criticism. It did happen. And like, and I think in that way, there's sort of a, a way that like Chomsky and his sort of innocence and his sort of, you know, people love Chomsky. I love Chomsky growing up. He was like a big influence on me. But then that question of like, and this also goes into questions you've had a lot about like the question of anti-imperialism, which has a lot to do. Chomsky is sort of an important voice of that in the US, but there is also this, even in his thing, this idea of like the necessity of being seen in order to sort of like have your agency given back to you. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like that's part of that thing that we were talking about in relation to Chomsky. I remember, like, the reason why I was watching Chomsky is because we're having all these conversations we are, which are related with uh, Black Marxism. And I, I, I think, I don't remember exactly who told me this, but it's like, oh, we, I don't really understand what Chomsky is doing. Um, and I would like, be interested to know what you think he's doing in relationship to what you think. So I started looking at some of the Chomsky things as well. And I think it, it came right in this point. You know, I think we talked about this even, like how even like part of this left leaning academia or intellectual position uh, does not address so much, you know, like miss, just like literally standing in front of them and they talk about it, but they missed it. You know, like when Chomsky says that, you know, like, talking to an audience, like the are people behind blackness, and if I don't look in the eye, I don't see you. So like, how can you even speak with these people if you do not know if, no, like if they are not there, if you are telling yourself they are not there because they are behind this thing that all you can see is the blackness, but you still tell them they are not gonna talk with them. It's just like, what well, I don't, I, it's, I got, I think, yeah, I got very confused by that. Um, and I think we just, it's slightly representational of what was happening in sort of our conversations as well, maybe. But just like, also like why references in general, you know, like why, like this is what we live with. Um, yeah. Um, one last question by Rich Frischman. He asks, all this work is so interactive and experiential. I'm curious how, how you um, as artists are affected by the subjective responses your audiences might display. So essentially like, <clears throat> I mean, maybe if you have, maybe you haven't had time to have conversations with people about the experiences in this work, especially since the biennial was really only on view for, for nine days. Um, but perhaps you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, what your interest is in viewership and how that might affect the way you think about your, uh, this work. 
or thought about it while you were making it? Um, I personally like talking to people about things and I'm curious about what they think. I don't think there is like, I mean, the possibility of getting in conversation with people is the main reason why I make the things that I do. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't, don't want anybody to agree with the things that I'm saying or um, to bluntly say, oh yeah, I feel like this is pretty much a, what is happening. I feel like the possibility of getting in conversation. You know, this, <laughs> Cause I think that that's for me highly interesting. And it's also a blank and terrible answer, but it's true. <laughs> Yeah. Um, is, there, is there anything else? Yeah, Chauvin. On the viewer, oh God, I don't know how to answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for joining us today. And um, I'm sorry that we can't get to everyone's questions. Um, I'm really <laughs> thrilled um, that everyone joined us. And thank you to our audience for um, really sharing, um, sharing your time with us. and. Um, and making this a really special occasion. And I, I want to thank, um, you know, everybody at PhotoFest um, for helping to support this project. I want to thank, um, you know, um, Mark Seeley for, for curating these two artists into this exhibition. And um, we hope that all of the viewers who are here with us today um, will join us again in, in the near future for the next, um, for the next Creative Conversations Digital.